quiero agradecer a todos los I would, I would like to thank all the speakers for the punctuality and for the presentations. Especially, it's been good for smokers to be able to have a, a little time between presentations for in order to grab a smoke. We are going to start in the last presentation that will focus on a current topic, a hot issue. We have been trying to work on this issue for some years and we'll see if, if the speaker is going to be able to provide us with uh, some news about how to work with schools. It's good afternoon. I, uh, I flew in from Los Angeles yesterday, so if, if, if I sound a little tired, uh, please, please bear with me. Um, you know, I believe after listening to the first two presentations and doing my research on the golf economy in Spain and, and after learning uh, about England a bit, uh, I believe it's, it's important to ask the tough questions to get to answers that can move us forward. And you know, what I've, I've concluded about Spain and the United States and England is, is that, as we all know, golf has been on a steady decline for quite some time, and everyone has different reasons for why. In Spain, it's down about 15% for participants uh, since 2010. Uh, we heard about England a second ago, uh, two presentations ago, that its uh, memberships have been on a decline for the last 10 years. Uh, steady decline. Uh, in the United States, we're down from 30 million players to approximately 25 million players, which is about 15 percent as well. And we've heard a term or a phrase that is universal around the world, and that is grow the game. And, and I wanted to first, before I go through a presentation, in, engage you a bit to learn what does that mean to you? So I wanted to start by uh, just anyone, raise your hand and we'll come by. But what does grow the game mean to you? Anyone? To have more players. To have more players. Si. Anybody else? More players. What, what, what else is it? more rounds? Does it mean uh, less time to play so more rounds? Does it, you know, is, that the, is that the difference? Does it mean that we have to bring golf to where it wasn't before? Anybody else have an idea what it means? Increase equipment? Roll back the ball? I mean, we're hearing all of these different things. Facilitate the game, meaning what? Facilitate to more people? So more access to golf for people. More abilities to bring it to different places. Excellent. Any, anybody else? What does grow the game mean? It's such a loose term. So many different ways to define. Anybody? So time being a factor, certainly. Absolutely. So anybody else? to get more business, uh, so grow the golf economy. More Absolutely, more profit. And there's, there's obviously a number of ways to do that. You, you get more participants, that leads to hopefully more equipment, more rounds, more lessons, more everything. But yes, growing the golf economy, whether it's worldwide or whether it's in a particular country, in my opinion, starts with participants. And we, we've, we've heard a term about the lapsed golfer. We've heard a term about the current golfer. And we've heard terms about the new golfers. These are all people that we can activate to grow that golf economy. And so what I wanted to start with is 
is TGA, which stands for Teach, Grow, Achieve. So we have created a school activation model that grows the number of golfers by making it available to all youth. And in America, only 5% of the population play golf. Only 3% of the five are avid golfers, core golfers to what they say play over 12 rounds a year. Self-sustaining and scalable model for both physical education, golf in schools, as well as golf before and after school. Now, what we've learned is, is that all sorts of associations bring golf into schools as physical education programs. And I can tell you that if you don't have an after school program or a before school program that is more structured to go with it, it will not work. You will struggle getting people from the schools to the golf course. Physical education, golf in schools, only transitions about 2% of all of the participants to the golf course. What we've also learned is that parent-funded programs, they provide a scalable and sustainable business. I heard it mentioned in one of the presentations earlier that you need to be vested in the sport. It needs to be important to the participants. And one of the ways in which it's proven that people continue to play a sport, whether golf, football, baseball, whatever it is, is if they play a certain number of times and parents have invested a certain amount of money into their child. It doesn't matter if it's a lot of money, but they need to invest a certain amount. That makes them feel like they are vested, like they want to come back and play more. And the irony behind people and the demographics of, of golf is that even those with a lot of means, a lot of money, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have access to golf. Most of them don't play. So they don't know where to start. They don't know where to go once they get started. So that leads to an entire consumer education problem within the industry. Because there are so few that play. In, in Spain alone, there's a little bit less than 300,000 people that play out of 41 million people. That's less than 1% who play. So you must educate them. Achieve. What we've done is, is we've created a turnkey model that transitions students and families to golf courses. And now I, I know that there's a number of you that think that you have to concentrate only either on juniors or adults. But in this model, you get both. And that is key to growing the sport because not only do kids want to play if they play in a fun manner, but once you activate the kids, you have a greater opportunity to activate the parents because of the time function. Parents want to play and experience what their kids are experiencing, especially if a lot of time is involved. So I wanted to give you a brief history of TGA. Uh, we are not an, an association. We are not that well known uh, outside of the United States, but I uh, wanted to give you a couple details. We, we were founded 12 years ago uh, in Los Angeles at six school locations. We launched a national program in 2006, and what we did was is we created a turnkey model for entrepreneurs, people who wanted to own businesses dedicated to growing the sport. You know, if you, if you look at it, we're going to talk a little bit later about the PGA professional and their impact on our program and the sport. But if you look at the PGA professional, especially in America, they used to have all sorts of ownership opportunities. 
They used to be able to own the carts. They used to be able to own the pro shops so they could sell equipment. And now, none of that is available. And so, how were they to fulfill their mission to grow the sport? And so, what we created was a turnkey model to be able to go into the schools, create revenue, and gain more participants to get to the golf courses. We started this entire company on 100,000 US dollars. And you will see the metrics in a second. So we launched a national program in 2006. In 2008, the United States Golf Association approved our curriculums. Now what that means is that any amateur in the game, anyone has the ability to teach a program and get paid to do it. Which is, which is challenging, certainly, because golf is the only sport that designates amateur and professional based on money received. In every other sport, you can coach, you can teach, and you can play at any level. But with golf, if you want to remain an amateur, play in US amateur, play in the British amateur, you have to be a designated amateur. And we are only one of two curriculums that have ever been approved by the United States Golf Association. And the reason for that is because our programs had more to do with academics, athletics, and rules and etiquette of the game than just skill development. And what we learned very, on, very early on was that in order to get into the schools, it had to be more than golf. It could not be just golf. I, I heard in the French presentation a second ago uh, about tennis. Um, in 2011, the United States Tennis Association partnered with us to create the same programs for tennis. And we have been successful doing that. I realize that we're, we're talking about golf here, but this is we wanted to show you that we are able to branch out through the model. In 2010, we created a foundation, and we also reached uh, 1,000 schools. So it took us four years to get to 1,000 schools. In 2012, we started partnering with PGA of America and their sections, and we expanded into Europe here in Spain. In 2013, and we'll hear about this more, um, we had the SCPGA actually run our programs as their golf in schools programs. We added more PGA sections, we expanded into Canada, and we reached 2,000 schools. So the first 1,000 took four years, the second 1,000 took three years. And then finally, something that we are very proud of, this year, we incorporated STEM into our curriculum. How many of you know STEM? No? So STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we incorporated that into our programs. And in the schools, very important because this is an activity that parents want and school administrators are asking for of the programs that are brought into the schools. So our key statistics, our primary age is, and this is obviously in, in American, is K kindergarten through fifth graders, ages five to 10. The reason why this age group is so important is because Golf needs to be on the menu of activities of every other sport and program that's out there. It, it must be there. It must be an option. One of the reasons why golf has steadily declined is because there are more things for people to do that take a lot less time. And if you do not put golf in the same space as everything else, the probability of the kids getting into the game 
and then staying in the game lowers dramatically. The other interesting fact about ages 5 to 10 is the age that's before team sports, you know, 5 to 7. So you have an opportunity to grab them before team sports get in. Golf is certainly an individualistic sport, but now we're going to have opportunities to grab them before team sports and then incorporate them into team sports as well. The secondary age groups that we teach, We start them young. We even get to them before the other sports, before the other activities. They are vested. They are already involved in the sport. We keep them in the game. And the interesting thing about these two age groups, we all talk about growing the game. We all talk about what age groups we can grow the game to. Certainly, the two biggest age demographics that we can grow golf to are 10 and under and 25 to 45. Those are identified as the biggest opportunity. Most people who play golf are, are older, have more time, and typically have more disposable income. But in this case, when you start running programs for these ages, you have the ability to communicate to their parents. You have the ability to communicate to the 25 to 45 year olds to activate them with them. And I will show you how we're going to do that a little later on. We have a five level program. I brought a little show and tell, I wasn't sure. But as you can hopefully see, we do hat clips. And they all, each hat clip has a ball marker. So as the kids advance from one level to the next and they graduate, they are able to stay in the program and stay with golf longer. We have almost a 50% transition rate from one level to the next. That's pretty high. The average transition rate for other sports programs is about 30%. So when you give them a pathway for them to go and give them an opportunity to achieve more, they stay with that sport. They stay with that activity. And this is the real statistic. We talk about growing the game. We talk about how do we get to people who don't play golf. 65% of our participants have never played golf before. And 75% have families who have never played golf before. So when you talk about getting golf into schools, just getting it into the school and having them experience golf is not enough. You must provide them a structured program for them to excel and stay in, as well as give them an opportunity to advance. 36% are female. And this number is rising. We, we, we heard from uh, the gentleman in regards to England about how do we attract more females? How, how do you get more women playing golf? It's, it's everyone's talking about it. Well, one way is let them play golf with their friends in schools. They're right there. They have an opportunity. It's a very comfortable environment for them. That's what females want to play with other females. The second thing is you get to talk to their parents, their mothers, who then want to play with their daughters. And you have the ability, once you are in the schools, through a structured program that, that gives us that avenue to speak to both females in the family. Now, our top markets, I'll show you the markets in a second, are running programs at over 60 schools in one area and working with three to four golf facilities, golf courses, to transition from schools to the golf course. In one area, generating revenue of over 300,000 US dollars. So our metrics. We have almost 450,000 participants in our programs. We have 2,400 school and golf course partnerships. 
We have 55 U.S. markets, two Canadian markets, and one Spanish market right here in Madrid. And this is the number that everyone talks about when it comes to, is the investment in golf in schools worth it? I know a lot of PGA of America, PGA sections have put hundreds of thousands of dollars the last five years into golf in schools programs, but they have nothing to show for it. They have not been able to successfully transition these students and families to the golf course because mainly it's a brush on what golf is. It's, it's not a structured program. We are transitioning almost 30% of our families from schools to golf courses because they are vested in the sport and the experience that they're having in our programs that we'll talk about here in a second. The other thing that we do in terms of metrics is we add full and part-time jobs dedicated to growing golf. I know that one of the questions or one of the responses in regards to how do we grow the game, we must grow the golf economy. That's not only in participants in revenue, but also in jobs. More jobs mean there are more people playing, means that there's more facilities that are being responsible to juniors and families. And it gives us an opportunity to grow the golf economy across the board. So our player pathway begins with school and community programs. We provide students and families of all demographics. So everyone, whether wealthy or not wealthy, have access to the sport by bringing it to the schools through a multi-level program. So kids have that opportunity to advance. This is golf's problem. This base is, is everything and why golf is not growing. Golf primarily concentrates on those who play, not those who don't play. So the stories that we tell, the marketing, the promotions, is almost all to golfers. We must grow this base. It provides us more opportunity to get more people playing. After you activate them in the schools and in the communities, you have a higher opportunity to transition to golf facilities. Greater opportunity to engage the entire family. And then you're going to create lifelong players. If you activate the kids, the parents will come. In golf, they have no choice. They have to transport the kids. They have to drive the kids. And it takes a lot of time. Now, I want to speak to the, the French model of the short courses because it is truly important when it comes to the health and where we want to go with this great game that we're all vested in. But creating lifelong players, you must start with the kids. Everything trickles up from there. So the junior golf market, what, what does it look like in, if you break it down in its most simplistic form, what does the junior golf market look like? Well, first things, there's introductory programs. Basic introductions to golf, school programs, golf in schools, structured school programs, uh, free opportunities at golf courses. But as, as we all know, those are typically few and far between, and they don't really, they don't activate a lot of people because it's very hard to talk to people who don't play. Recreational. This is for your people who play golf, but you want to provide them a, an easy environment to learn and to continue with building their skills. Professional instruction. So you've activated somebody enough that they've been introduced. You've activated them enough that they've come back to the game. And now they want to get better. They want to take that next step. And that's where the professionals come in. Competitive, HS stands for high school. And that's in America, which is you are 15 to 18 years old. This is where you get your com competitive high school players. And then you get your very accomplished, your high level performance player 
on the competitive junior tours that you have. This is where TGA concentrates. And it's definitely not where the traditional golf industry has put their time and resources into. Golf has done a great job at keeping people in the sport. But where we have struggled is growing the base, getting new people into the sport, and keeping them in the sport. That's the traditional industry. Concentrating on professional instruction, getting them to high level achievers, instead of looking at growing the base, growing rounds played, creating more short courses for enjoyable, enjoyable opportunities for the whole families or kids. And the irony behind all of this is that players do not move the needle. Uh, the French presentation talked about Yannick Noah and about how even though he was a great player and so accomplished, it didn't help the tennis world grow in terms of participation. I, I grew up with Tiger Woods, played with him on tours. And I can tell you that even in America, junior golf during Tiger's heyday was down 12%. You know, right now everyone says Jordan Spieth and Justin Rose and Charlie Hall and all of these great players that are up and coming, but they don't move the needle. Programs at the grassroots level grow this sport. It is not the, the economy of the tours. All the wealth and money there does not translate over to growing these sports. And as I mentioned, in, in the United States alone, the junior golf industry is down 17% since 1995 and 37% since 2005. That's a big drop. And when you have, for a period of what, 10 years, you had the most popular potentially athlete on the planet in Tiger Woods in the sport of golf, and, and he didn't grow it. We've talked about these. And I wanted to, again, engage you about some of the barriers to entry of golf. So for kids, it's not convenient. It's, it's, it's hard to learn. It's hard to get to a golf course. You need to have golf clubs. You need to know what you're doing. It's a different, it's a different language that you have to speak. It's entry level cost prohibitive. In order to go to a golf course, unless you're there taking lessons, which can be very expensive on their own, you must have clubs and potentially shoes and balls and a hat and, and everything. But nobody knows that. And then when they learn, it's very expensive to get involved. And then it's hard. Golf is hard. Golf is difficult to learn. And so if we don't give people the opportunity to learn in a fun way that makes it easier for them to have success, we're dead in the water. Because getting people to try golf is hard enough. Getting them to be good at it, as we all know, is very difficult. You have defragmented grassroots programs. Nobody's working together. Everybody has their own piece of the pie. The golf industry must work together in this way. And then you have, again, I. I I've been in the golf industry for 12 years. I've been playing golf since I was three. My parents did not play. I was introduced to the game through my grandparents. My parents did not know what to do when I started swinging a club. The majority of the industry focuses on who plays. We must focus on who does not play and give them that opportunity. Now, I wanted to engage the audience again. What are some of the other barriers to entry? What prohibits us from growing the sport? Am I am I correct in saying that people even without a license play though? Yes. So it happens. I mean, we talked uh, 
the English gentleman, says that there's 1.2 million people without membership in England who play golf. That's a lot of people. And I think that there were about 650,000 that do. That's almost twice as much. So what are some other barriers to entry? Well, give me the barriers to entry for Spain. Image. image. What's the image? Prestigious. Uh, Prestige. Elitist. Not, so not everyone can do it. You have to have money or you have to be good. Correct. So when you're, you're doing your promotions, your marketing materials to promote the game, make sure it's inclusive of more people smiling and having fun. So many promotional materials you see with people with their heads down and the professional standing next to them giving them lessons. That's not going to speak to somebody who doesn't play. That's very intimidating. What else? Difficulty of the courses, yes. Yeah. You mentioned in your presentation you, you use something called tee it forward. That's just a gimmick. It's a name. All you're doing is making courses shorter because we all know who play golf, mostly if you are a player and you play further up, you're probably going to score better, although we know it, it all comes down to putting anyway. But that is certainly one opportunity to make the courses a little bit easier for people. It also makes it more fun because we all know who play golf. If you move tee up, back, whatever it is, it's a different golf course on a different day. So what are some of the other barriers to entry? Access to golf courses. And I would say in including, included with that, not only access to golf courses, but it's also the language that you need to speak. Do you remember the first time you went up to a golf course? Did you know what to do? What percent of the population who's never played golf before do you think can go to a golf course and will know what to do? Not many. That's why those introductory programs that we, that, uh, that we talk about throughout the industry, the get into golf, the get golf ready, which is what it's called in the United States, it's not only the programs that you're selling, but you're selling an experience. You're selling an opportunity for these people to be welcomed at the golf course. And that's why we talk about programs like what England is doing, where how the person experiences golf for the first time, those first few times, will be influential to them staying with the sport. Everybody remembers growing up. Everybody remembers what they did in their formative years between 3 and 10. Because that is the way you're programmed. That's the way the, the mind works. If you have a good experience with golf, and it's fun, and it's inviting, and it's welcoming, whether or not you become competitive in high school, or you play in college or university, it doesn't matter. You will remember that later in life, and you have more opportunities to come back. And you will have better feelings to coming back to the game. Any other barriers to entry? I mean, we're, nobody's talked about time. Time is huge. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that people who go play golf, it's generally a five to six hour commitment and a minimum. Even if you're a member at a club, you have to get ready, go drive, you have to warm up, most likely. You then play and then you socialize potentially afterwards. Even if you don't and you drive home, it's five to six hours. It's a lot of time. Anybody else? Barriers to entry. I prefer interactive sessions rather than just standing up to the podium. El implicar a los padres de que involving parents so that they involving parents so that they take the child to the golf course and staying there. All the time that the, the, the child is playing golf. So one of the barriers is having the parents move with their children. Absolutely. The parents, because the two largest age demographics that have the opportunity to grow in terms of playing golf, not only in terms of playing golf, but being educated on golf, is 10 and under and 25 to 45. And that's the age of the parent. So when you go to schools and you activate kids and families who don't play, you have that opportunity to talk to, to communicate with the parents. 
and let them learn, start to learn the language of golf and let them experience what their kids are experiencing. So that does solve one of those barriers to entry without a doubt. You have that communication barrier. It's, if you look at it in terms of industry, it's customer acquisition cost. How much does it cost to create a golfer from a non-golfer? And the majority of what we're doing in the associations, in the federations, is talking to golfers. But this way, in going to schools in a structured program, and I will show you how we do it here in a second, gives us that opportunity to start talking to and acquiring customers who do not play golf. So our school program, how we do what we do and why are we different and unique? Number one, we, are, we conduct programs before and after school, year round. Weather does not matter. And I'll show you why in a second. The curriculums and trainings were developed by PGA professionals in America and PhDs in curriculum and child development. Our programs are as much about character development, life skills, STEM, math, English, science, history, rules and etiquette as it is about golf. We are selling golf, but the experience that you're selling is much more than golf. And that is what parents want for their kids these days. They want well-rounded kids, not kids that are laser focused on one thing. They talk about all these studies that are out now that the best golfers haven't always only played golf. They've played every other sport. They are athletes. You're creating athletes. And in schools, you want to create not only golfers from school programs, but you also want to create well-educated, mannered students. Five levels, as I mentioned. So the kids advance, and it's station-based. How many of you have given a lesson where kids stand in line behind waiting to hit? How many? Nobody? That has been the norm in the industry for a long time. They wait. So what we do is create stations so the kids are always doing something. Whether they're chipping, putting, hitting, whether they're working on rules and etiquette, whether they're working on academics, they're always doing something. There's always movement. And then in this day and age, with fitness being so important to people and activity, we also incorporate that into the program as well, adding a station in. So as I mentioned, every class includes all of these things. It's not just golf. It must be more. You must have well-rounded programs that then have well-rounded kids. So here are some of our programs in action. So we had to create, you know, granted we started the program in Los Angeles where the weather is good all the time, but we had to create a program that could be done anywhere, whether it be in gymnasiums, outdoors, indoors. This was the second program I ever ran in a hallway of a school. Look, it, it can't be more than three meters wide. It's just long. And we had 17 kids sign up in a hallway paying $150 for eight weeks of programming. That showed me that there was an inherent demand for this program and a lack of supply of golf. If people are willing to sign up in a hallway, 
you're going to get them eventually to a golf course because they were hungry, they were thirsty to be introduced to golf. They just never had the opportunity. There was never any access. The value to the parents. Golf is a choice. Everything parents decide for their kids to participate in is a choice. It costs money. It takes time. You are fighting. We are fighting. Golf is fighting against everything else. Against football, against baseball, against lacrosse, cricket, everything. So how do we put golf on a level playing field with everything else out there. We have to create a value to the parents. And the first way that we do that is we price a program that is basically the same as everything else. Now we talked about, you, you talked about the Barrett entry as the elitism, the potential of what people, people think golf is. But if you bring golf into schools in a voluntary program that parents sign up for and you charge a nominal fee similar to everything else, golf has won. Because you are breaking down that perception, that barrier. You have a greater opportunity to get people to participate. We provide everything. So we talked about one of the barriers to entry is the startup equipment you need. But in this case, we provide a price that's the same as everything else. You provide all the equipment. So all they have to do is run out of school in shoes, sneakers, whatever, and they can participate. And we provide all of the promotional materials to activate, to let the parents know that golf is available. Golf is here. You can play. Anyone can play. And most importantly, you can play right here. You can play where you don't have to transport, where it doesn't take a lot of time, and kids can play with their friends. And they're signing up to do this. It's easy. It's easy for the parents to access. And that is the key. It's, if you make it as easy as possible to get people who do not play golf into golf or to try it, you will be able to grow the base. And if we know what happens if we grow the base, all the opportunities, memberships, rounds, uh, professional lessons, revenue for equipment, everything goes up. That's where the concentration needs to factor in. So after the schools, we talked about introductory programs. Now we need to look at recreational programs. So they've tried the program, but what's the next step? You must provide that player pathway for your participants. Provide that consumer education. You know, when I first started the company, we had two years, and then in the fall, when school started, nobody signed up. And I said, I started asking why. I started asking my parents. I started asking the consumers about why they stopped. And they said, well, we thought it was done. We, we thought that was the golf program. And I said, well, what do you need? And they said, we need levels. We need more progression. And so we added different levels. We need to hear what our customers want. And in our case, what our customers wanted was the opportunity to go to golf courses in non-competitive formats, in just fun formats to be able to play. So we created play days. Play days are single event, one day, promote to your schools and your communities, like branded. And what that means is, is that TGA is the first touch the first experience of golf for a lot of people. They come to you, they look at us as a resource for what's next? What do I do next? And so we have that opportunity to show them the pathway. But 
in a like branded form with TGA programs at golf courses, the value rises. Because you're already in the schools, you're already trusted, the parents have had a good experience, the kids have had a good experience, so they will trust you to go to the golf course and tell them what to do next. And this is a very easy way to do it, through a play day. It's non-competitive, it's non-threatening, and guess what? It includes the parents. Why? Because they have to take the kids. It's transportation. So you have the ability now, as whether you are a golf course manager or a professional, you have the opportunity to communicate to the parent. And com non-competitive, kids these days, they just want to play. Too many times have they been focused directly on being competitive and being the best. Kids just want to play with other kids. We need to give them that opportunity. Camps. There are a lot of different types of camps out there. Camps can be very advanced camps for your tournament players. Or, and which I suggest you have as well, is your lower level recreation camps. Opportunities for kids and parents to have fun. You can run camps anytime. Out of school time. During holiday. Any time that these kids are not at school, if they are already vested in a golf program at a school, they are going to look to the next step and to what's next out of school with, at golf courses. These camps, they build skills. So now in the schools, you have a program that's not censored on building skills, but is golf related. But now when you get them to the golf course, you really have that opportunity to build their skills up and the rules and etiquette knowledge and let them expand their experience at the golf course, which is very important. On course play. I, I, there are so many camps out there <clears throat> all over, I've seen them all over the world, that the kids come, they come for a week or three days or four days or five days and they only get to play once or twice. And that is not what they want. I realize that every time you take a tea time away from an adult group and you potentially give it to juniors, the course could potentially sacrifice revenue. But we've already seen the statistics today from, from, the, from England, from Golf England, that says when you get somebody new into the sport, how much money that can yield for a golf course. There are so many golf professionals that think that a camp with six or seven kids is all they can handle. We run camps with 30 to 40 kids at each golf course. And we employ five to seven people at each golf course to work with those kids. You're creating employment opportunities, but the kids must play on the golf course. They must. And you must differentiate between the facilities, between the different golf courses. And one of the ways that you can do that is you can play different golf courses. We have, we want to be different from the golf camps that are out there in America. And one of the ways that we make ourselves different is that during a week-long camp, they play three different golf courses. The camp may be stationed at one golf course, but they go to other golf courses and play throughout the week. It's fun, it's exciting, and it provides an introduction to more golf courses, to more new players that grows the golf economy. And this, of course, generates revenue for facilities and the golf professionals as well. <clears throat> Leagues. Not tournaments, but leagues. This is the future of junior golf. Team-based programs. How do you create the experience that these players get in the Ryder Cup, in the Junior Ryder Cup? I mean, you hear the stories about how great it is to be part of a team. Leagues are the future of junior golf and providing recreational leagues. Competitive, 
but not very competitive where all ages and abilities can play. We all started somewhere in sport. We all, we all were never the best, but we played, most of us played team sports. And we have to create a platform and a program that gives us the ability to do this for golf as well. We started for the first time leagues this spring. First year, first programs, 25 locations throughout the United States, almost 2,000 kids signed up. If that's not a sign of demand for team programs with golf, I don't know what is, especially with short courses. Very great opportunity there. So the formats in our leagues are based on age, just like every single sport out there. Age divisions, not ability, but by age. And I understand that golf, what makes us unique is that, especially with the handicaps, you can play golf with anyone of any ability, of any age, play together, and have a good match. But with kids, a six-year-old does not want to play with a 15-year-old. An eight-year-old does not want to play, or a 13-year-old does not want to play with an eight-year-old. It's not the way it works. Kids don't, don't look at it like that. In tournaments, maybe, but not, but not in everyday play. You need to have an inclusive environment for beginners. And the formats that we use are scramble and best ball, depending on the age group. If you want to go into more detail on leagues, I, I'm certainly available afterwards or for questions. But the idea is, is that you create a progressive competition and formats so that the kids will progress as they get older. It makes golf easier and more fun. And it also increases revenue for the facilities. More leagues that you get, more people to the golf course, the more revenue these facilities will get. Because once you play in a league, it's almost like playing in a tournament. You need your own clubs. You need your own balls. You, you've captured the parent and the student at that point. Because if parents are willing to drive their kids to a golf course for a series of lessons or leagues or tournaments, you, they will be golfers. It will be a family activity. So what we did in America, in addition to our program, was to create a, a charity. So we have people who can give back to the communities because certainly not everyone can afford golf at its highest level. But we want to give everyone the opportunity, especially as you identify talent. So our mission is to change lives through sports. And as I mentioned, we not only run golf, I mean, golf is our core, but we also run tennis programs as well in partnership with the United States Tennis Association. So our mission is to change lives through sports. So it's, it's, it's golf, but it's about impacting the lives of these kids and the parents and providing them with a great experience. So we provide scholarships for students. Those who cannot quite afford, but, but what we learned is Everyone should pay something. They will not be vested. People who receive free programs take them for granted. They do not, they're not, they don't think they need to continue to participate. It's not as important if they are vested. And the two ways to vest parents and kids is through money they spend and through time they spend with that activity. So we also provide programs for special needs students. Golf is different because we're an individualistic sport. So anyone can play individual. It doesn't, you don't have to be part of a team. So we have opportunities. We've run programs with people who can't hear, with people who can't see, and even sometimes with people who can't walk in wheelchairs. We have that ability through our curriculum to be able to teach them. 
And then we talk about, with golf, we talk about how do you make golf important? How do you vest people in the sport? And I can tell you, one of the ways we do it in America is through the school programs, you provide higher education scholarships, scholarships for college, for university. So people have an opportunity who participate in our programs to be able to earn university scholarships through golf. Doesn't mean they play golf at that high level at university, but it means that they have opportunities above and beyond golf through academics and to be able to continue because of golf. That is a positive connotation. It keeps them interested in the sport. So our industry partners out there talked about how important it is to work together. The grassroots programs in golf mainly do not work together. We're starting to see them for the first time work together because everything's on the decline. You're starting to see some leveling off, but overall, Golf has been on decline, and we need to continue to provide opportunities for them to grow. So we work with PGA, certainly the USTA and the USGA. But what you'll notice here is that our other partners are not golf related. They are about schools, and about youth sports programs, and about physical fitness programs. That is just as important as working with golf industry partners. These are the people and the associations and organizations that help you get to the people who don't play. And that's the name of the game for us. If we're going to grow that pie, we have to get to people who do not play. So we'll, you'll all be able to relate to this, our value to the PGA member. There's four segments that, that we provide for them. Number one, we provide jobs. We grow the economy. We give them opportunities to come into the schools. But ironically, golf professionals are not the only ones that we employ to teach in the schools. <clears throat> in fact, I would say that of all the coaches that we have in our schools, maybe 10% are golf professionals. Most of them are very focused on teaching golf skills, which is great, certainly something that we need. But the majority of our people are university students, people who play recreational golf, uh, retired people, teachers in the schools, educators, because it's more than just golf. If you're going to provide people to get them into the sport and make it fun, you have to branch out. It can't just be for golf professionals. Now, golf professionals certainly will be the ones when you get them to the golf course to take them from there. But the basic introductory programs, you don't need to have golf professionals. And not only that, typically golf professionals with their hourly or half hour rates, it prices you out of the market. Remember, we have to provide a comparable product to everything else out there. So golf professionals can be at the golf courses and receive all of the new players that we get from the schools to them. Increased job security. How many golf professionals do you know that potentially lost their jobs because either the golf course closed or they don't have enough work, enough private lessons? I can tell you in America, there are thousands of them. I know that for the first time, the PGA of America has lowered the number of professionals. They used to say 28,000, but that number is really like 26,000 because there's not enough work. Golf courses are closing. They're, they're going to other industries. Business ownership opportunities. If you've ever worked for yourself, and all golf professionals are, in fact, their own bosses, if you've ever worked for yourself, the opportunity to own a business that is dedicated to growing the sport or working with an association or a federation in some way that is dedicated to growing the sport, it's inherent. It's, it's, it's within them. It's the passion. The passion is to grow the sport. If we don't provide them opportunities to do so, 
you're not allowing them to fulfill their big potential. And I bring this up one more time. It gives the PGA members the opportunity to engage adults. Now, I know a lot of PGA members, they don't want to work with kids, especially kids who are just beginning or kids in groups. They want to concentrate on the adults where they can work one-on-one. -on -one. That is typically their training. And so giving them access to the adults by bringing them to the golf course is key. It's key to the PGA professional. It's key to the health of the golf courses. It's key to growing the golf economy. Our value to the USGA and the PGA of America, we're the feeder system. <clears throat> we grow some of their initiatives and their programming. We take the introductory players and their recreational programs and we push them to them to their tournaments, to their professionals, etc. Again, we are the growth of the game initiative that reaches the two age demographics that have the most room for growth in golf, under 10 and 25 to 45. Job opportunities, can't stress this enough. If, a, if, if an economy is going to grow or if it's going to recede, the jobs are the number one, the first thing that's gonna be affected. We need to grow the sport. <clears throat> Revenue generation. We're providing healthy facilities. We are providing through getting new people into the sport, through activation, through, the, through a golf vision, and how it's viewed, giving it the ability for people to go to the golf courses and generate more revenue. And finally, brand visibility. It's important for people to know, for consumer education, who, who runs all of this? Who are the important associations, federations? Who do I talk to when I get in the sport? And so working with your grassroots partners to grow golf for people who don't play is so very important to the federations and the associations because then that's what they know. If you start to play golf and you don't know about the PGA, the USGA, the Spanish Federation, any, any of this, Golf England, whatever, they'll never know. They're not taught from the beginning and we all know from consumer acquisition and the cost that to re-educate somebody takes time and money. And you don't want to have to do that. It's, golf is already hard enough to grow. I wanted to give you an example of what we do with an association with Southern California um, to see. It would, be like, it would be like almost with us working with the uh, Spanish Federation, but in Madrid. So it, it kind of a chapter. So they acquired and managed three programs for us in three distinct geographic territories in which they hired somebody full time to run the program. We are their golf in schools program. We are the only one. They work with our programs. And as I mentioned, they're hired three full time people to manage these chapters. They hired over 30 PGA professionals part time to instruct the programs. So not only are they hiring people to manage the programs, but now because of the ability and to get golf into the schools and people signing up, they're hiring the PGA pros to also instruct the programs. They have their foundation. Their foundation supports golf in schools programs and the students so that we can either lower the cost of entry into the sport or we can provide scholarships for kids who do not necessarily have the opportunity. So this gives us the greatest chance to grow golf within a community with every demographic. Wealthy, poor, it doesn't matter. If you provide an opportunity that's easy for them to access, they will come. And finally, most important, and this is what everyone talks about, 
it becomes a seamless transition from schools to their tour. They have a high level junior tour. It's the number one junior tour in America. So we are feeding that from the school programs and through the leagues and the play days and the camps. This is a sample of what all of the parents get. It's the player pathway. So you can see that we've designated for the parents what's introductory, what's recreational, and what's competitive. <clears throat> we must educate the consumer. We have a program that we institute with our schools. And after everyone takes a program, they get a survey. And it's one question. It, it says, rate your experience, 1 to 10. And then it says, would you recommend this program to somebody else? And why? And I will tell you, we have the highest score of any youth program in America because of what we provide. But the number one complaint is that parents don't know what we do. Parents do not understand golf. They don't know how we teach it. They don't know anything about it. And so we have had to re-educate them. We have had to create consumer education programs. Because nobody plays golf. I mean, in Spain, less than 1% of the country plays golf. It's a, we all know because we're in golf. We all know how to speak the language, but parents don't. They don't know what to do when their child gets involved. They don't know what a birdie is or what a bow. They don't know any of that. So it's our job, especially in the introductory programs, to educate the parents. And that's where partnerships like the PGA of America, like the Madrid Federation, help us because we get to speak a different language to the parents. Again, consumer education. It's a communication tool for parents and kids so they know where they're going and what they can do. And, and the most important part, it provides a seamless transition from schools to golf courses. Last but not least, most people have heard about the first tee. People always ask us, how are you like the first tee? Number one, we are, we're very complimentary to them in the programs that we run. The first tee is very golf course and facility based in low income, kind of uh, low demographic areas where we focus on all demographics. Um, they concentrate again on the low income under resourced people and they run a lot of physical education programs but not before or after school programs. But I will tell you the number one complaint about the first tee is that they do not have measurable results. There are no metrics associated with it. They do a great job at impacting kids, a wonderful program, but they do not grow golf. They will tell you that it is not in their top five priorities to grow golf. It's not what they do. So I wanted to conclude, I'm very fortunate in the sense that I am the last presentation, so I got a chance to listen to the two previous ones. But I wanted to I wanted to paint a picture, and unfortunately, I, I didn't have a chance to make the slide, so bear with me. Imagine in a community, you have the ability to go into all the schools. You have the ability to communicate with people who do not play, with people who play, and you have the ability to activate them and break down the barriers into golf. And then you have the ability to get them to golf courses. Golf courses such as what the, the French said, short courses. It's genius. It is the future. It is exactly what introductory courses should be like. The more people you get involved at the schools and the easier the transition is to the golf courses, the more fun it is, the more success they have, the better and the longer that they will play. So then imagine the opportunity to gain memberships from this. Memberships not only for that golf course, but for those federations as well. And then imagine the pathway 
that you can have for these kids from introductory level all the way up to tournament level because the programs that you're running at that golf course as the gentleman from England mentioned that the golf courses are prepared as are the professionals to teach those kids to teach those families both beginners and advanced players what you have created in essence is you have created a golf ecosystem that thrives and is self-sustaining and the problem that the golf industry has had is that if you remember the slide from the junior golf the golf industry has only concentrated primarily on the competitive and they have not grown the base but if we can grow the base together and create this golf ecosystem it will thrive it will work on its own and ultimately it will grow the golf economy so I thank you for listening I hope I, I I hope I made some sense. I'm a little tired again, but um, I will, of course, take any questions now. <clears throat> yes, um, I will. We have, uh, I mean, we have enjoyed your presentation and. Uh, <laughs> Um, now we know what you do, what uh, the content of your programs, etc. But you, have you got any data about the outcome of your programs, namely the number of uh, average number of of, uh, of kids uh, uh, that made the transition, the ones that have competed, uh, the ones that after two or three years are still golfers some some data about the outcome of the program thank you so it's a, it's a good question what we realize is is that sometimes organizations and companies want to be everything we don't we want to be the introductory and recreational level uh, I can tell you that students on average in our programs will spend up to nine hundred dollars a year in the golf world I can tell you that they're gonna spend an average of four hundred and fifty dollars in our programs one specific student I can tell you that they will stay in our programs for up to two and a half years um, I can tell you that almost thirty percent transition to golf courses but that data that you're looking for it's something that we're interested in and we may look to do in the future but it's not what it's not what we do we want to get kids to the golf course we want it to be recreational and have enjoyment for them and we want to pass them on to the professionals and to the programs at that course and the tournaments etc we don't want to be everything we can't be everything there there I don't think with the the way the golf industry is set up that you can have one company be everything and so our job and I think we do it well we have access to about I think it's 1.6 million families in the United States. We have gone through about 450,000 kids. So we know approximately that we've got uh, about 125, 130,000 kids to the golf course. But we, we have the economic impact, but overall from a stance of how many kids are playing competitive, et cetera, we want people to play golf. Oh, recreational golf? How many rounds? Define that more. That's not working. <laughs> Still not working. I can hear you. It seems to me that to be chosen and to compete is crucial. It's a key question. So, when you go and make a decision between the golf school and the golf course, because we, I mean, we, 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 uh, we do the curricula in school, so that's fine for us because we do everything in the school during curricula. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's fine. So, so we read some schools, the easy and the same, but then we struggle in the transition and bring them then to bring them there, we think, it seems to us that it's easier if it's 
Pero I'm kind of following and I apologize if I'm not. So there's I don't I don't think that there's a choice between schools and golf courses. Yeah, I think I think you mentioned that. So what we have learned is that you said you know you go to a school and you do a golf in schools or you do one day there. What I'm what what we're showing and what we've seen is is that that type of practice, you're right, doesn't get kids to the golf course. Um, it's it's just what they call it in uh, what I what I like to call is one touch, one touch and you think they're going to go. It's not what happens. In in the programs that we run, these kids are are working with us for six to ten weeks long, one to two days a week, that these parents are signing up for, and it's in the schools. It's not the is it? No, it's after school or before school, exactly. but it's at the school. Okay, that's not the curriculum. No, but we do that too. But the key is, is that structured programs in the schools lead to higher retention at the, to the golf course. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, and so, and yeah, I, I, that's why I was, I was a little bit confused there, but no, it's, it's when you look at the, when you choose kids for tournaments and you say, okay, well, I'm going to choose these 10 boys and these 10, this, these 10 boys and these five girls at this school or these at this school and play against each other. What I'm saying is, is from a league standpoint, open it up to the community. I mean, in America, and, I, and I'm not quite sure, I apologize how it works here, but if you want to play football, if you want to play soccer, Anyone can play. It's not school related. You're signed up at that local park that has, you know, five soccer fields. Anyone can come play. Why can't we do it where you create leagues at golf courses where that's your league? If you live within a 10 mile radius of that golf course, you go and you play golf, you play golf league. Anyone can play, and you have an inclusive environment that makes it so that whether you're a great player and you're a tournament player, or whether you are a beginner, you have the opportunity to play because it's based on age, and that's the way every other sport does it. Golf doesn't need to reinvent the wheel. I think we try to do that sometimes, but that's a different subject. <clears throat> um, if I've understood correctly, you've put into practice the program in Madrid yes. with the Madrid Federation. Well, Is it sort of exactly what you've explained or can you briefly explain what you've put into practice here in Spain? So, so far what we've put into practice here in Spain from what I, I gather, we are just starting out in a few schools. So we're starting to get our feet wet and getting kids to participate over and over again. And now we are going to start looking to expand into more schools as well as start to build some <coughs> some golf course partnerships to be able to get those kids to the golf course and run play days, camps, and leagues. That's where we're at right now. Okay. Have you used your philosophy or have you used the philosophy that they have sort of transmitted to you? I think we're kind of working together, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So we're kind of working together to intertwine them because we, we know some of the things that we've done in America doesn't translate over. I'm, I'm not a proud guy. I mean, we know that we don't know everything. And so there are a lot of opportunities to work with your culture and what the Federation is interested in um, to make this a success. But I do feel from, I, I have got a good understanding of what golf is like here in Spain. I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth in terms of number of programs that you can run. Si quieres yo te cuento lo que hemos hecho un poco en la Federación es que... I can explain what we have done in the Federation. We complement each other. We help them introduce themselves in the schools where we're working and we um, 
introduce ourselves as a federation in the schools where they are. They are different programs, but they complement each other. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Are there any other questions? Yo quería saber. I wanted to know which is the protocol, the procedure from the selection of a school, what contact is offered to them, and in which way we collaborate with the schools. Okay, so the procedure. So this, it, it's different everywhere. Some schools will have, have specific after school or before school programs in which you can contact and become a participant. Others will ask, we've, we've get it a lot where, <clears throat> where they say, oh, so you want to come here? And you say, yes, I'd like to teach golf. And they say, well, you, there's a golf course, go teach it down the road. But in our case, with the programs that we've created with the education experts and the education subjects, they're viewing us as an extension of the classroom. So it gives us a greater opportunity to go into the schools. But who you talk to and the procedures that you use to get into the schools, believe it or not, it's different at every school. It could be one school could be right next to the other. And two completely different people with different titles you would need to talk to. But once you get in and you get that ability to teach in the schools, you, you have the opportunity to set a schedule. And then you have an opportunity to promote the program. And there's a number of ways in which we provide that ability to promote the program. Does that answer your question? I know it's just it's a very difficult one to answer. <clears throat> Hola. Eh, what would be the profile? that takes the teaching to the schools. Really, the, actually, the, the professional, the golf professional, is not really interested in teaching children. <clears throat> uh, uh, the beauty is, is that there is no description. Um, what we do is we, cr we have training programs that they go through. So everything from online training to in-person training that teaches them as much about classroom management as it does about teaching golf. So teaching, when you're working with kids that are 3 to 10, making, teaching swing plane or teaching them high-level philosophies, or, that's not important, especially when you're in a school. The key in school programs is to make it fun, make it inclusive, and to provide a well-rounded experience for them. And so in that case, we're teaching them on, we're teaching the coaches on golf skills, classroom management, rules and etiquette of the game, uh, how, to, how to play games with the kids, how to conduct contests. It's everything. It's not just about how to teach golf. But in terms of who teaches them, as I mentioned earlier, it's all walks of life. Anyone can do it as long as they have a passion for kids and a passion for golf. At this introductory level, we can create a coach that is vested in, in growing the sport. What material do you use in the schools? What, what, sorry? The material. Oh, what material? Are you yes. talking about um, uh, physical materials or equipment? Equipment, sorry. <laughs> um, we use junior golf clubs um, that are uh, different for boys and girls, as well as have five different heights, so you can measure to any kid. And then we used, that's why I brought them. We use the almost golf ball. Oh, good throw, huh? <laughs> so we use, this is called the almost golf ball. Everyone here drinks wine, I assume, except for you. So um, 
it's like a synthetic cork. So it's soft plastic, so you can throw it against anything and it's not going to break. So you can do the programs indoors or outdoors. And then we bring in, and then we bring in uh, other training aids for them to use. We bring in uh, putting mats. So even if you're on the grass or cement, you have the ability to simulate a golf course. We create targets for the kids to hit to. Uh, it's, it's across the board. It just depends on what, what that specific lesson is. Does that answer your question? Cool. <clears throat> I know I would need this. <laughs> sí. Mi pregunta es, este programa está... My question is whether this uh, program is only designed for schools or if it also allows for the, for it to, can it be adapted to a, a, a training carried out at a, at a golf course, at a club? Adapted. We've had a lot of golf courses ask to use our materials at the golf course, um, but what makes it unique, again, the industry struggles getting new people in. And if you, run at, if you run at a golf course, it will be just as successful. But what makes it unique and differentiates golf and golf programs is the ability to bring it into the schools so that you can activate and communicate with people who do not play. But can it be used at the golf course? Absolutely. And it also would create a differentiator um, for your program because building a more well-rounded student would be very beneficial to parents. So it's not just about golf, it's about education and fitness, et cetera. A lot more room on a golf course to run around than a school. <laughs> the, the equipment that you, that's used in the program, uh, how much does it cost and, and who pays for it? Does the school pay for it? Does the, in the case of the federation, does the federation pay for it? How does that work? Um, so in some cases where, where, where we've got, uh, more grant funded programs, more free programs or partial scholarship programs, uh, it's included within that. But the majority of it is paid for by the people delivering the program. So what we looked at, if you want to look at the economics of the model, uh, we, have a, we have a school package that costs about, um, it's about $1,200 uh, USD. So it's uh, in euros might be thirteen or $1,400. But that's good enough equipment for five schools. So if you look at that amortized over, the equipment can last five to six years. And if you're running two to four sessions at a school per year, it pays for itself within a year and a half to two years. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Any other questions? With this last presentation, we are going to close this meeting. We hope you have liked it, and I only have the need to congratulate the three speakers for the presentations, and especially Javier Gervas. I'd like to thank him for his translation services and for getting in contact with these speakers. I'd like to thank as well the media present. There was another important event here in Madrid, which was the Ryder Cart. We didn't know when I contacted them, they didn't have any problem with changing the date so that we could host this meeting. Thank you, everyone. This is the beginning, and I hope that we can enjoy more uh, events like this. Thank you.